Well, hello, good morning, and welcome everyone uh, to this very special Bath Life and Bristol Life Business Surgery, and I hope this finds you well. Uh, today's uh, session is with leadership strategist consultant, former Google Chief of Staff, lecturer and author, Anne Hyatt. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Anne. We'll be talking with her fairly shortly. My name is Greg Ingham, and thank you for joining us on what is our largest business surgery. Zoom fatigue? Pah! Come on, this is going to be very special today. Today's session will delve into Anne's own inspirational career path from how the dot-com crash of 2001, where she was in Seattle, coincided with her graduation uh, coming onto the, the, the jobs market at that exact point in the most tech of sectors of cities. How did that work out? And exploring the parallels of that, uh, between that and what students face now after this baleful year and with uh, what wholly new opportunities there might be for them. And also the insights that Anne gained from working closely with Amazon founder Jeff Bezos in that hyper growth early to early noughties phase, and then being chief of staff at Google and to its CEO, Eric Schmidt, some CV, some stories. Please send your questions and thoughts using the Q&A button below. Do add your company name or education institution to your question or be anonymous if you prefer. We've had uh, several questions already. Note that today's business surgery is being recorded will be on both our Bath Life and Bristol Life uh, YouTube channels later this afternoon. First, uh, some updates from us. Um, maintaining the education theme uh, on what is A-Level Results Day, which is obviously such a big day uh, in, in the UK. Our next Bath Life and Bristol Life Business Clubs will be exploring education in each of the cities. Bristol's is on the 24th of uh, August at 11am, once more sponsored by Bevan Britain, and Bath's will be on the 26th of August, a couple of weeks away, uh, uh, sponsored by Mojas Drew once more. Thanks to both our sponsors. And please do talk to us if you'd like to be on the panel for each. We have a Bath Life Business Surgery on September 6th, uh, again at 11 a.m. with the University of Bath's Risk School of Management. This is about a detailed analysis of the retail sector, which will be fascinating. There's also a Bath Life Presents uh, special webinar on the 13th of September uh, with Kingswood School's head, Andrew Gordon Brown, more education. This is a time of learning for us all. Um, you know, we, we've all learned far more than we would ever have imagined in the last 18 months. Some of it good, perhaps most of it good, who knows? We'll be running further Bath Life and Bristol Life business surgeries, these specially curated deep dive sessions showcasing companies' expertise through discussion. Please do talk to us about how you might be involved. Beyond that, uh, the Bath Life and the Bristol Life uh, Awards. Here we go. We're just four weeks now to the Bath Life Awards at the Assembly Rooms on the 9th of September. Tickets are currently on sale only to finalists, and there's very few left. Thanks also to our headline sponsor, the Royal Crescent Hotel and Spa. A week later, these are back-to-back -back awards, it's the Bristol Life Awards on the 16th of September at Ashton Gate. Tickets are on open sale via the website. There was a right old Sergio, as a technical term, in sales last week, so they're already in short supply. Again, thanks to our headline sponsor there, which is March Commercial. Both these events will be joyous, celebratory, much needed occasions, an opportunity to come together, and there's been huge interest in them. The chance to actually see people in real life together to talk, to experience, to celebrate, and to highlight the very best of these two cities. These are both uh, postponed from earlier this year awards. The Bath Life and Bristol Life Awards 22 will be held once more in the spring. And please, if you're an ambitious company or one seeking to rebuild your business pipeline or plain proud to be a leading Bath or Bristol company, please do consider sponsoring. All details are on the respective websites. There are also property awards in each city this autumn, and again, in real life, of course. Bath Property Awards, 22nd of October, the Apex, sponsored by Moja Stewart, headline sponsored. A variety of sponsorships and tables are available, individual tickets on sale only to finalists in Bath. Nominations close next Thursday, so 19th of August. Bristol Property Awards returning, uh, this time it's Ashton Gate, 12th November. Limited number of sponsorships, it's a huge array of sponsors you can see there. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, our thanks to each. Um, plus, plus there are tables and tickets available on the website. Noms uh, are open until 21st of September, so a little bit longer. And they're, as ever, they're free to enter. Entreconf, a quick uh, uh, highlight here. You, you may have seen that uh, Anne gave an absolutely superb keynote at our recent Entreconf events, our conference for entrepreneurs. And for those powerful insights, provocations and dynamic business stimulation, please see all the talks on entreconf.com 
or on our YouTube channel. The other news on EntreConf is that we're holding a special EntreConf dinner on October 1st at Avon Gorge Hotel. Details are shortly. At the heart of all we do in the two cities of Bath and Bristol are Bath Life and Bristol Life. We're very, very proud to publish magazines that celebrate the very best of these incredible cities. We're here to celebrate the good stuff in Bath and Bristol, in print, on screen, and in person. Thank you for your support. Okay, let's do this. Let's introduce our speaker for what's going to be a fascinating Bath Life and Bristol Life business surgery. Um, let's bring forward uh, Anne Hyatt, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about Anne as uh, she's pressing that button. Anne received her initial business training during 15 years as executive business partner, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, and chief of staff to Eric Schmidt, CEO and exec chairman at Google Stroke Alphabet. Anne now consults with executives and companies across the globe to reverse engineer mm, their moonshot goals and get results. Anne's recently relocated from Silicon Valley to Europe, to Europe and we'll be talking about where you are and what you're doing in a moment, and brings with her a unique perspective and what it takes to succeed in business today. And it's also author of this. Let me show this. Here we go. Look at that. That's a, that's a, that's a very, very literal plug. There you go. And the author of um, Bet on Yourself, published by HarperCollins next this year. And welcome. Thanks, Greg. It's so fun to be here. Yeah, well, it's uh, very good to see you. And uh, I'm going to take you back to the beginning, which is uh, not that far back, but let's go back to the beginning. Talk <laughs> us through what you were studying in Seattle at the turn of the millennium. And how far did that prepare you for what you wanted to do or indeed did? So I studied international studies at the Jackson School within the University of Washington in Seattle. My original plan A was that that would lead me to a PhD and that I would become a professor. I was always fascinated with the world. Um, I had lived abroad. I lived in Sweden for a couple of years, and I was really inspired by what was happening, particularly in Europe. So my studies, my um, dissertation at the end of my undergrad was uh, focused on the European Union and its effect on social democratic states. And this was a time, if you remember, right when the euro was being launched. And mm -hmm. so this currency, which had been created years before, was officially coming um, to use in 2002, the year I was graduating from undergrad. So a lot of my senior year studies was focusing on these emerging economies and the way in which that was changing businesses and um, global politics and all of those um, interesting things. So that was something I was really excited about. I actually worked at the European Union Center on campus and really got to um, put together some interesting lectures and programs inviting uh, European <clears throat> professors and dignitaries and politicians in to kind of um, educate us on this but kind of once in a lifetime sort of thing. You know, you don't have a major currency launched every day. So that's the environment that I was in and the original dream of what I was studying. So, you, you know, the environment was, the immediate environment was related to the EU and the big tectonic plates of new currency. Um, it was also the time of the millennium bug, which for at least uh, nine months was yes. the world's worst thing and then did somewhat dissipate. But it's also that time <laughs> on crash and that had a, a more material effect to, to many in that short term period. Come back to that in a sec. It really did. Yeah, I grew up in Redmond, Washington, and that is the headquarters of Microsoft. So my entire, you know, a formative years of, of early education were in this tech city of Seattle. And then, yeah, I absolutely watch it all come crashing down my senior year, my last year of undergrad. And, and you must have had, uh, I don't know, if not parents, certainly friends of parents and so on, or, or other colleagues or brothers, sisters who were in tech businesses, and it just went yeah. kaput like that. It disappeared almost overnight. Most of um, my friends, by the time I was in high school, so my parents moved to Seattle in 1985, not anticipating this tech boom that was just in its infancy when we came there. Mm. My parents were both farmers. I'm actually first generation non-farmer in my family. And so when my dad got, um, after the Air Force, when he got a job in the big city with his first, uh, after law school, his first position, they were looking for a place where they could raise a family in an environment that was familiar and friendly to them. So Redmond was a place outside of the big city of Seattle where they could buy a big house with a huge yard. My mom planted this enormous garden. Our neighbors had horses. And then just by the time I was in high school, the entire city of Redmond was tech heavy. All of the parents of my friends in school were tech executives, early, you know, programmers and coders. And so it dramatically changed over the, the formative 15 years of my life after that. 
And so you, you've mentioned about the, uh, the, the academic focus. Um, so you had, a, you had a, a very broad plan or a sense of direction, but that's pretty, pretty rapidly changed. It did. I was a very serious kid. Like I don't know many 10 year olds who are, you know, their dream job is to be a professor, but that absolutely was mine. I was always um, very serious about my studies. Uh, my mom actually used to set an alarm clock, um, not to see if I'd snuck out and gone out with friends, but to make sure I'd put my homework away and actually went to bed just to make sure. <laughs> um, so that was kind of the, the type of kid I was. But uh, yeah, I had really, really big dreams and I wanted to do something exceptional. I wanted something on a global stage. I didn't really know what shape that would take yet. Um, but I knew I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself, something legacy level. And talk to us, I mean, other, other than uh, your, your mother with the, the alarm clock and so on, uh, just about the, the advice you were given uh, by, by parents, friends, school, etc. How good were, were you at receiving advice then and, and even perhaps now? I've always been somebody who seeks out opinions and approvals, and I always look for best practices to emulate. Um, so I was maybe a little bit too receptive to all possible prescriptions for a successful life. I really took them to heart. Um, I wasn't exceptional. I was an exceptional student. I wasn't exceptionally talented in one particular area or another. And it wasn't until probably 20 years later, I actually realized that was an enormous gift that the universe gave me. Because if I had had any particular talents in an area, my perfectionist nature would have just gone straight there and I wouldn't have left that comfort zone. So it was actually such a benefit that I was pretty average in everything I tried. I did well. I was really willing to outwork everyone around me to increase my performance. But um, I was really forced to get comfortable doing things I wasn't going to do perfectly, having to like work insanely hard. So my parents were our self-made people, as I mentioned, first generation non-farmer. My dad had seen the hard life and the toll that that farming life took on his dad and his three older brothers. And he decided that he wanted a different dream for himself. So he actually decided he wanted to be a fighter pilot before he'd ever met a fighter pilot or seen a fighter jet in real life. But he made that dream come true. So I saw that behavior, that big dreams and working insanely hard towards your goals modeled for me in my early childhood. I was actually born on McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida, just after my dad finished pilot training and beat all the odds and was chosen as a fighter pilot. And he flew the F-4 Phantom Jet my entire childhood. So that's the environment that I came up in. So I saw this ability to seek out and dream bigger and be unafraid of doing things that no one around you has ever done and just put in all the hard work. So my dad, after the Air Force, then decided to go to law school. And it was a big coming down from being an elite fighter pilot where people would stand up and salute when he came into the room. And he was a full-time student and worked as a janitor at night just to provide for our family and to make that next dream come true. So I saw the way he constantly disrupted himself, created new dreams, worked insanely hard, did whatever was necessary to meet his next goal. And so that's kind of this um, beautiful upbringing that I had of just don't be apologetic about your big dreams and just work harder than anyone around you. Don't be apologetic about big dreams. I think that's um, the, you know it's quite that's one of the, the first inspirational points today. Particularly as mentioned, this is this is A level results day, and, yeah. and point about you know not going perhaps too deeply into a specialism because as, as you perhaps very modestly say, you, you weren't exceptional at that point. That was an advantage. Whereas many many uh, young people they they're, they're pushed into or feel themselves pushed into a sector uh, through education or whatever, uh, which which can be limiting. Do you, do you, you subscribe to that that uh, don't limit yourself at uh, 18 21 or, or whatever oh, i i wish i had fully embraced this advice when i was that age i remember very clearly the day that i got my equivalent i think it's the equivalent mm -hmm. uh, so in the states we take a university entrance exam called the sats and the sats you take first when you're 16 and um, i remember the day i got my results in the mail and i cried for at least three hours inconsolably <laughs> because my dreams were so big and my results on that exam were so average and I thought that that had just disqualified me from what I wanted most in life. And um, looking back, I really wish I could tell young Anne that life has a bigger adventure in store for me than that, that dream of my 16 year old self. I was able to have adventures and opportunities 
honestly work in companies and industries that hadn't even been invented yet. And so I didn't need to worry about qualifying for that old model of what success looked like because a brand new thing that had never existed before was about to take over the world, this thing called the internet. Uh, but that was something at 16 that just didn't exist and I couldn't have even fathom to dream about it. And so if anything, if there's someone out there who is having a hard day today with your A-level results, this is not the end of any kind of dream. This is an opportunity to really pivot and maybe think more creatively or more broadly about how to turn your passions and your talents and your dreams into something, into a new type of reality. And I, I have to tell you, like <laughs> this plan A or C or Z, whatever I'm on now, far exceeds what my plan A ever would have given me in terms of joy, accomplishments, fulfillment, uh, learning. I'm, I'm actually really glad it, it didn't work out the way I dreamed when I was 16. It sounds as though it's both, um, you know, don't allow others to define you by your academic record, good, bad, whatever it might, or average, not bad, uh, whatever yeah. it might be, um, but equally don't define yourself by that. Um, Most importantly. Yeah, what you are at 16, 18, 21 is, is not who you are, at, you know, whichever age subsequently. Um, let's, let's come forward to this, uh, this, this move to Amazon. Um, how did it come about? Let's talk through how you, you, how you got picked for the interview, what your resume was like at the time, and also the interview processes. Yeah, that, it's a really good story, actually. So as I mentioned, I was working a student job at university at the European Union Center. And because of the state of the economy, there were no jobs. I and none of my peers had any offers, even free internships. I think I sent out minimum 50 resumes and didn't even get a call for a phone interview. Uh, so when graduation date was getting closer and closer, the director of my program asked me what my plans were after graduation. I said, I, I had no idea. I, I didn't have any prospects and no one was interested. Um, and I had my plan was still to become a professor, but I wanted some work experience. I wanted some real life experience before going into the depths of academics and narrowing my focus. And so he just suggested um, that I apply to Amazon and I had not considered tech at all. I was not interested in tech, um, but his wife worked in recruiting there. And that's literally the only reason I applied. I thought, eh, why not? No one else is calling. Um, so my interview process was actually took nine months. I did three different rounds of interviews. The first round was with um, all the assistants in the company. At the time, I think there were 11, um, which is funny now. I, there was less than a thousand employees at Amazon at the time. Now they have 1.3 million employees, which just boggles my brain. Um, so I did that round. Uh, I actually scored really well, but it was just a really long process. Then I came in for a second round that was with all SVPs. And then the third round was with Jeff Bezos himself. And in that interview, he only asked me two questions. One was a brain teaser just to see the way my mind thought and if I could take something really complex and break it down into manageable steps. And then he just asked me about my life goals and plans and, and you know, basically that traditional, what's your five-year plan question. When I shared with him, I wanted to, to, do, do, um, do, do you, uh, do you recall the brain teaser and uh, were you able to answer it? <laughs> in great detail. I can, I can still relive every moment of that. So he asked me, and I actually didn't know until very recently that this was a go-to question of his. I thought it was special just to my interview, but it wasn't. Um, he asked me to estimate the number of panes of glass in the city of Seattle. So at first I thought, okay, because I'm, you know, I'm 20 years old, 20, yeah, early, early 20s. This is my first actual formal job interview. I'd been a receptionist before. I'd worked at a five-person startup before, but like a formal interview like this, this is a new experience for me. So I hadn't anticipated that, even though it's um, very traditional in tech to ask brain teasers. So I just thought, okay, why is he asking me this? Um, and I thought, okay, he wants to see if I can take this big complex problem and figure out what are the elements needed to solve and get to an answer. So I told him, okay, I... Um, Let's say there's 1 million people in the city of Seattle, just to make the math easier. I said that because I had literally no idea how, what the population of Seattle was, but luckily that was about right. Um, and then I said, okay, everyone has a home, a mode of transportation or a job, a school, so, somewhere they're going during the day. That's kind of represents the different places they experience glass. And so I thought, okay, um, how do I account for outliers? Because sometimes you have multi-generations of a family living in an apartment. Maybe you have a tech millionaire who's got a whole house, a mansion to themselves. Uh, some people, their mode of transportation is a public bus. Some people have multiple cars just to themselves. 
maybe you're, you've got a, a corner office with a lot of glass, or you've got um, what I was at the time in, in my student role, sharing an office the size of a closet with five other people. So how do you account for these anomalies and outliers and then get to a result? So I said basically that, and he, instead of taking that as an answer, Jeff stood up, uncapped a pen, went to his whiteboard. What I didn't realize at the time was I was in his personal conference room and three of the four walls were floor to ceiling whiteboards. And we filled all of the whiteboards until we got to an actual answer. He circled it, capped the pen, sat down and said, I think that's about right. And I was just like, okay, I was exhausted. It felt like it took hours. I'm sure it was only five, 10 minutes that we went through that exercise, but he really wanted to see, could I chase that all the way to the end to, to a result, to a number that we felt good about. Were you, um, were you scared when you went for the interview or, or, or at least, uh, you know, worried? No, because they did not tell me I was going to be interviewing with him. So I didn't have oh, the opportunity. <laughs> I didn't have the opportunity to be terrified in advance. But the mm. second he walked in the door, I knew who he was because he mm. was already a celebrity in Seattle. Mm. He had been Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 1999. He was often on the cover of the Seattle Times, our newspapers, our you know, local media. Um, but Amazon was not what it was, what it is today. It was not yet profitable. It had a, had a single profitable quarter, but not yet a profitable year. Everyone, all eyes were on Jeff because again, trillions of dollars of investments had disappeared overnight. And for many investors, their investment in Amazon was their only remaining opportunity to recover their losses from the dot-com bust. So it was a high pressure environment. It, he was absolutely kind of a, he was definitely a local celebrity, not the global celebrity that he is now. So there was some of that factor. And when people often ask me like, what was it about you and your early 20 year old self who had no experience, no tech degree, no connections at this company? Why did he hire me? I honestly think one of the elements was I wasn't starstruck by him. Mm -hmm. I could talk to him like a normal person. We could have this back and forth engagement and even being the nobody intern level, you know, applicant that I was, um, he, I think he appreciated that back and forth. Maybe I was comfortable enough because I'd grown up around tech execs. I knew kind of how their brains worked and I felt comfortable in that type of space. Um, but I, I think he liked that I didn't so get we've, we've, we've had a, um, a question from someone watching about this whole CV re resume area. How do companies judge the potential of their candidates based on their CVs or resumes? I mean, they themselves invest a huge big chunk in marketing, this person is saying. So they know the value of talking up what they do, but a CV is a, is a fairly limited document. And on that, that's the basis of the initial judgment. How does that work? Yeah, so tech actually takes a really unique approach to this. Um, I think they got a lot of things wrong in the early years. So in the early years, <clears throat> they were trying to solve for the right result, which is they don't focus so much on the core competencies. They focus on people who are gritty, disruptive, creative, and willing to pivot and, and learn a lot really, really fast. They're looking for those elements more than core competencies, because the theory is that if you bring in a smart, brave person, you can teach them to do anything. So that's the premise on which I think is very, very true. And I wish that more organizations would hire for that and for value alignment that came later. So with that goal, they actually were really only hiring from top 10 universities, which meant you got the same Ivy League guys, which meant you got a lot of white guys, a lot of people who just look the same, who have the same socioeconomic background, same cultural backgrounds. So in the long term, that absolutely needed to be disrupted. And thankfully it was. Um, but the early years were very much about that. So that was what they were looking for on your resume is, do you have a track record of academic excellence? Do you, have you done something really creative? Do you have, they were especially looking for, have you taken on some really big goals for yourself? Have you played it safe or have you gone after an ambitious dream and been unafraid of not being good at it for a very long time until you can master it? So that's really what tech is looking for in the resumes. Now, thankfully, they've now added the core element that I think is most important in this formula, which is now looking for value alignment. When you're hiring for value alignment, you're not just looking at your academic resume, but you're really looking for what gets you out of bed in the morning? What excites you? What's your North Star? Are we all being pulled towards the same mission of what we want, the change we want to see in the world? And when you add those elements and you're a little bit more creative about looking for potential academic rigor, asking the right questions, doing really hard things, 
then you get this really beautiful combination of diverse candidates who come at problem solving from lots of different angles and expertise. And I think that's the really special model of Silicon Valley hiring that I see as a best practice now. Yeah, so uh, uh, to, to try to, to nutshell that, CVs are, are of course important, but don't just let them be a litany of academic achievement. Yeah. Have, have the, uh, the quirkier elements, have the, the big plan, the, the, the whatever, the, the, the different yes. elements of you as a personality. Let's come on to another defining element, certainly with entrepreneurs, which is obsession. It's not just useful, it's absolutely essential for entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt. But did you yourself get drawn into that obsessive approach by dint of the daily culture and drive in both businesses? A hundred percent. I don't, a lot of people don't know this, but one of the names that Jeff considered for Amazon in the early years was relentless. In fact, right now, if you type into your browser, relentless.com, you get redirected to Amazon. So that was an environment that I was in at an Olympic level from day one. And I loved it. I've always been really drawn to characters who dream really big and unapologetically. Um, I was absolutely not a great example of work-life balance (laughs) in the first part of my career. I just, um, but the reason why it didn't burn me out was because I was so mission and value aligned that nobody asked me to work 18 hour days on average. I just did one because it was necessary. We were trying to do something no one ever done before. We needed to do it faster and better than anyone else. And most importantly, third was I didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to be the one who didn't come on Saturday when they broke through and finally solved that big problem. I wanted to be there and be part of that story and be, I didn't care what role or title I had. I wanted to just be in the room. And I think that was an important element in my early career of just, I was so motivated to learn as much as possible, as fast as possible, that I just was willing to do anything and wear any hat I needed to qualify myself to be in that room. And I didn't burn out because it was so enriching and my job was giving as much to me as I was giving to it, which was a very high bar. But that's how you really find that passion alignment and um, that kind of engagement. That's how you get a lot out of your employees. For some people, perhaps many, um, a career is a, is a happenstance, um, at best mm-hmm. by a sense of direction or possibly even talent, who knows. Um, but I suspect you, you would argue we should all be much more purposive, much more deliberate in our career choices. I mean, I wish I could say, I know this all sounds very like well-engineered in retrospect. <laughs> it wasn't, it was not some grand plan of mine to work for three of the most uh, powerful and impactful CEOs in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it did just kind of happen. However, uh, so while I didn't have this, like how I was going to take over the world plan that it might look like in retrospect, I did know that whatever seat I landed in, I was looking for three things. I was looking to be in a disruptive environment um, where I was going to be on the forefront of whatever was happening next. That was always important to me. Two is where I was going to learn the absolute most. And three was working for a leader I wanted to become like. Not just someone that I liked and enjoyed, but did I want to become like her or him? And when you seek out those three things, you naturally up-level in whatever role you're given. Like my first title at at Amazon, I don't even remember. I think it was like junior most, (laughs) like admin assistant. Like, I don't even remember what my title was. It was so unglamorous, but that I didn't let that confine me. It didn't matter what my actual job description was that I was hired to do. It mattered what, what did Jeff need from me most? And I was going to do that. I was going to raise my hand for things that were far senior to me or that I had no idea how to do. And I think that's how you create opportunities for yourself, regardless of your title or formal authority level or seniority, is just really looking for what I call the win-win-win. I did not coin that. I stole that from um, John Maloney, who's the CEO of um, Whole Foods, a a really great brand in the United States. He calls it a win-win-win. When you want to grow in your career, so you've got your personal goal, your win, what do I want to learn? What types of projects do I want to experience? Who do I want to be working with? And then you see a need of your direct manager of like, how can I take something off their plate and you know, remove some kind of burden for them. And I get the experience of something that's a growth opportunity for me and frees them up for bigger impact, which then allows them to serve the greater purpose of the company. The company wins, your manager wins, and you win, you get a yes every time. So that's how I got permission to work on things that were far outside of my title or comfort zone was when I could frame it in that way. Now, at the time, did I know that was what I was doing? No, <laughs> but I just, looking back when I got those big opportunities, those three things were were all in place. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a phrase that we live our lives forward, but we understand it backwards. And uh, yeah, which yes. you know, one way of post-rationalizing strategy, I guess. Um, yeah. You mentioned also there about, uh, about, about luck, uh, fortune and so on. Um, Seattle in 2001, 2002 feels like both good and bad luck in one go. This <laughs> environment, then the collapse. So talk about the, the parallels. And they, they may not be that, that uh, immediate, but the parallels you then compared with students graduating now during or perhaps even following the pandemic. Yeah, I do think there's a lot of parallels. And I any students or parents of students who are worried about what you're going to possibly do in this crazy environment we find ourselves in, nothing but good came of those challenges. I had to be more creative. I was forced to think about how to use my skills or accomplish my goals in really different ways than if my plan A, for example, what I had assumed I would do out of university um, before going to my PhD program, which I did do after three years at Amazon, I I had applied for all these research roles, all these roles that honestly would have kept me really small. I would have been sitting in a back room and writing something that only one or two people ever read. Um, That's what I thought would lead me more naturally to my big goal of becoming a professor. However, what I learned at Amazon did prepare me for grad school and grad school actually, unbeknownst to me at the time, was preparing me to have a career of much bigger scale, bigger impact at Google than my academic aspirations ever would have. And so... um, my message is really this, that it's good if you're being disrupted in your original plan and having to think more creatively about how to learn what you want to learn, how to get in the room with the people you admire and want to walk this life journey with, and the impact you want to have in the world. Because the opportunities, like, look, me in 2000, 2001, I was, um, I did not know that the entire world was about to be disrupted by this thing called the internet. That was not obvious yet. Um, but the fact that this this incredible luck came that my first job out of university was working for Jeff Bezos changed my life. So I I do think that we're on this pandemic has created major moments of disruption. It has fast forwarded uh, technologies, academic research and companies by minimum five years, often 10 years, because we wouldn't have been brave enough to pivot and make these radical changes that we have as fast as we did. So I really think we're on the verge of this next new thing that we don't have a word for yet, because I don't know what it is, probably some kind of version of AI or something. But I just want to offer you that hope that if your first, if your plan A has disappeared, it's because something newer, better, more revolutionary is coming for you. But I would just seek out those opportunities to be in the driver's seat of, of this disruption, learn as much as you can, and really seek out the people who are mission aligned with you. Talking of learning, um, what, what did you learn, um, particularly from, from close proximity to a company in hyper growth under Eric Schmidt? So your, your Google mm-hmm. day. What, um, and in fact, just one prior step to that, Google's got a notoriously thorough and complex recruiting process. So what was that like for you? But, so both yeah. what it was like and what you learned. So getting, I was recruited by Google. Um, it was about a year into my PhD program. So I'd, I'd left Amazon after three years, started my dream program at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, it was my ideal program. I was focusing on the European Union, their effect on Scandinavia. It was, it was my dream. Um, but then about a year in, I started getting calls from a recruiter because of the work I had done with Jeff. Tech was, was then and still is now a very small world. So everyone knows everyone. Um, And long story short, it took them about a year to talk me into interviewing. I came down and it was really about the people. I mean, I, I, um, I I came to campus. They talked me into, well, they they got me to say yes, because they were like, don't you just want to see the campus? I'm sure you've heard the stories about the free food and, and our wellness centers, and you can bring your dogs to work and people are playing volleyball. And I just wanted to see how do people get anything done in that environment while I was there was when I was really realized these were my people. The the projects they were working on, the passion with which they did their work, the vision for how they wanted to shape the world really aligned with what I wanted to do and helped me see that it was really in alignment with my plan A, but it would 10X my potential output into the world by doing it there. So that's how they got me. But even though even though they recruited me, once I said, okay, I'd be, I'm willing to consider leaving my PhD. What, what do you have in mind for me here? They made me take an exam. (laughs) They made me, they put me through all the rigor, all the interviews. And by the end of that process, 
I really wanted it. And um, yeah, I, my first role was working for Marissa Meyer, who is at the time the um, vice president of search products and user experience, which basically means we just got to make really cool stuff. And other people got to figure out how to monetize that. But we just wanted to serve people and solve problems and help them learn and explore. And then after three years of working for Marissa, I was recruited to then work for Eric Schmidt while he was still CEO. And I stayed with him for the next nine and a half years, nine and a half of the 12 years I was at Google, I worked for Eric as CEO. And then while he was executive chairman. So and, the and, evolution. You know, um, an impossible question. So you uh, prep an, an impossible answer. Um, in those nine and a half years, what what do you think your on reflection your your key learnings were from that time with Eric Schmidt? So my favorite example is um, Eric had a plaque on his desk, literally a brass plaque that said, "If at all possible, say yes." And he embodied that to the extreme. Now that plaque is not about over committing yourself, not saying no, not delegating, micromanaging. It's, it's actually the opposite of that. It is getting yourself outside of where you're comfortable, where you're always the smartest person in the room and getting, remaining insatiably curious. Um, for Eric Schmidt to have a goal of not always being the smartest person in the room is a very high bar because he's exceptionally brilliant. But he always wanted to be seeking out um, new technologies, new environments, talents. I mean, I, I put together a dinner for him once of like playwrights, you know, like he knew nothing about theater or that. And he just was like anything that's outside of his area of expertise he was leaning into. And so while I was watching him model that behavior every day, it not only gave me permission to do the same, but it was kind of demanded of me that I was constantly learning new things, seeking out these ex exceptionally talented people, bringing unexpected people into his orbit and really informing our work. When you work at a company like Google or Amazon, where literally every single person on the planet is your intended user, you really need to know what their lives are like. What, what are their problems? What are their sticking points? How can we, where are we more similar than different? And how can we create something that, that brings all of that together? So if I had to boil down nine and a half years into a single lesson, I hope it was that. Eric really taught me to be brave, be insatiably curious, and to say yes to, to things that maybe really terrify me at first. <laughs> There's, um, there's some great advice in there, in, insatiably curious. I mean, if, if you're not curious about stuff, I mean, what, what are you? You know, um, maybe, maybe it isn't the, the right environment you're in. Um, but also just to, just to keep pushing, keep testing, keep yeah. new areas that you just don't understand, don't, uh, don't fully feel comfortable in, because that's how you learn. Um, we've, we've had a, uh, another question from a, an external uh, watcher saying, related to this point, what part of your career has taught you the most? Well. I actually think periods of disruption by far have been the pattern of when I've learned the most. So we have that original dot-com bust in the early 2000s when I was trying to just get my start in the world. Then at 2008, I was working for Eric while he was CEO during that economic crisis and watching the way in which he pivoted the company and tried to really support our global users who were all in crisis as well. And then <laughs> once I got brave enough and after 12 years, I decided, okay, I'm a little too comfortable here in this Google Nest, my little safety zone. I disrupted myself and I moved from the States to Europe, set up my own startup. My, I was a company of one at the time, not anticipating that in six months, we were gonna have a global pandemic. So I've had these three periods of massive disruption in my career where I was forced out of my comfort zone. And I think that's my answer is really seek out disruption because if you don't, you will be the disrupted. So the best way to remain in the driver's seat of your career is to do that for yourself because that, otherwise the world's coming for you and it, it, it is inevitable. People think that their comfort zone is their safety zone, but I really truly believe that that's when you get complacent and that's when you can be disrupted by some external force. I would rather be the one choosing how I'm going to disrupt myself. And um, so, and that's when I really, really learn the most is when I'm outside of my usual, when I'm really leveling up, when I'm sitting at new tables and um, inserting my voice into conversations that I've never been a part of before. That's when you learn the fastest. Yeah, the, the whole concept of safety zone, uh, whilst it, it may have applied, it may have been very attractive uh, as far back as, uh, or rather up to uh, January, February 2020, 
it just doesn't exist now. This has been this has been the learning curve that anything and in fact everything can change and does. And um, written this uh, this book, I'll give you look, I'll give you another plug as well. There you go, better yourself. I mean, I'll look at that. Um, <laughs> Uh, out uh, reasonably soon. Um, yeah. Why have you written it? So I was a reluctant author. I um, A lot of people have published author on their bucket list. That was not why I wrote it. Um, for me, this is not a bucket list or a vanity project. What really compelled me to write it, and I think it's probably a cliche, most authors probably say this, but for me, really, it was that I felt like I had such a privileged elite education I was witness to some irreplicable moments in history, watching the internet in its infancy, watch Jeff Bezos not only invent e-commerce, but the gold standard of e-commerce, watch Google in its infancy. When I joined, when I joined Google, there was less than 5,000 employees and it was not the dominant search engine. It was not the default search. Yahoo was very much the dominant player mm -hmm. at the time. And the year I joined in 2006, the company doubled in size. Like I was there for the hockey stick part of the growth. Those moments don't happen very often. So I really wrote this as a playbook to give people access to the things I learned the hard way, the best practices I saw modeled by Jeff Bezos, Eric Schmidt, Marissa Meyer across my career. And then I think most importantly was I use my career as a case study in this book because I think a lot of people opt out in thinking that the best practices of these celebrity CEOs could apply to us normal people. I want people to really see that there was nothing exceptional about me. There's nothing that makes me any different than anyone listening to this talk right now. And I was able to take those best practices from my CEO mentors and apply it into my own career to create extraordinary things out of really ordinary opportunities. My job titles weren't glamorous. My original job specs weren't either, but I saw this behavior modeled and I translated that into my uh, my career goals. And what I really want is for people in reading this book, two things. One, there's some really super fun stories from the early stages of the internet that I think um, no one else can really tell. And two, and most importantly to me is there are some, some patterns, some best practices that will apply to anyone, regardless of your career stage, your industry, your uh, authority level, that really will put you in the driver's seat and allow you to say yes to your wildest dreams. That's really why I wrote it. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a great point lurking there that, um, you know, you did have that, uh, you've used the word privilege, that, that extraordinary opportunity or opportunities of, of that time. Um, many people just don't experience that, but all of us can get inspiration from wherever. And if it's not at first hand from Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt, it can be from uh, such as uh, your book and, and your insights. On the uh, point on the, on the book, on, the, on the, the blurb, I think it is, it says, recognize, own and implement breakthrough strategies. Can you give an example of that, either directly for you personally or that you've seen in others? I think that's a really great question. I'm flooded with like <laughs> options of things to illustrate that. I mean, I've absolutely done that several times in my career. So I call that my car, my core ROI, recognize, own and implement. Now, the traditional definition of that is return on investment, which definitely mm -hmm. applies to individual careers. But I like to see it as when you recognize that's really you being very thoughtful and purposeful about what you wanna contribute into this world and what you wanna do with your one single precious life on this planet. So first creating that roadmap for yourself. Second, when you own it, that's when you are assembling your mentors, your sponsors who can open doors for you. You're, you're asking for specific next things. And then implementing is once someone has sponsored you and got you a seat at that table, really like adding your unique value add. I can think of many times, each time I reinvented myself, it tends to be around periods of every three years or so. I, I get, I don't know, I get, I, I long for that like next new thing. I, I, I get bored with, with um, normal. So I've purposely disrupted my career. Even though I was at Google for 12 years, I had four very distinct growth stages within that single company. So you absolutely don't have to get a new role or even a new title to really re-up and, and, and level up in your career. But the, the stories I think are most exciting to me are ones that come to mind of my CEO clients during this most recent pandemic. I've really watched some incredible growth happen from companies that where everything was going really, really well. They didn't, before the pandemic, see any need to disrupt themselves. For example, um, I'm on the board of directors for a local company in Bristol called Armadillo. 
And Armadillo really had to get very brave, very fast because they had big international um, clients like McDonald's UK, Carnival Cruises, which obviously was in a state of <laughs> massive panic, um, like not knowing how they were going to survive or come out the other side of this. Uh, so they had to be really creative about one, how are they going to serve their clients? Two, how are they going to protect and create a safe environment for their employees? And three, how are they going to disrupt themselves to prepare for this new model on the other side of this when we had no idea and maybe even still aren't quite sure where the light at the end of this tunnel is? And I think those are the stories that I want to celebrate the most is you don't have to be Amazon or Google, like doing something of big impact in your town, in your community, within your family um, is are really the stories that are my favorite at the moment. I can think of so many people who have given themselves permission to turn a side hustle passion project into their main focus now when they when they saw that like, okay, if, if my life is gonna be full of un, in uncertainties, why don't I just decide for myself which uncertainties I wanna take on? So I, I love these micro examples. Um, of, of really implementing that that model. Great, we've had a, a question from Jonathan West who, who asks this, uh, tech companies are often founded by techies whose focus is on building great products uh, or, or services, which is not always enough for commercial success. But what advice would you give tech leaders to push through to the next level of growth? Yeah, well, actually, Jeff Bezos is not a techie. I mean, he was <laughs> at an investment firm before he yeah. found it. He, he did not know how to do any of this. He doesn't have a computer science degree. Google's the opposite of that. Google um, is absolutely co-founded by high te highly technical people. And they brought on Eric Schmidt, who had technical experience and had been a professional CEO of three companies before. Um, so I've seen both models. You don't necessarily, don't self-select out if you're not a techie. And if you are, for me, the most important thing in, in creating a pathway to success is not necessarily so much in what business school teaches you, which is like product market fit and what you're going to put out there. And, you know, I think the biggest indicator of future success is who, who is on your team and in the seats next to you and having a very clear idea of who you're serving. I don't think enough entrepreneurs focus on the who. So be very, very, very selective on your, especially your early hires if you're a startup, because those are the people who create your culture. It does not matter what you write on the wall or your company values. That behavior of how you interact with that early team is going to become your culture and it's almost impossible to change after that. Um, so I would really focus on the who, having the highest hiring standards you can possibly have and a very clear idea of who you're serving. Um, I think a lot of, especially those who have the wonderful challenge of early success and you have this hockey stick growth, it can be very tempting. And I've seen this in several of my clients. They just want to get people in the seats. They just need to fill it because they can't keep up with the pace. And that is always to your detriment. I highly recommend hiring slow, firing fast, if, if someone isn't a good fit. And I know that's easier said than done. That's really, really hard to do, but that's what I, that's my biggest advice for leaders of tech companies. Okay, we've um, our, our good old friend, anonymous attendee has asked a question about, uh, which you, you, you sort of touched on, how, do you disrupt your personal life in the same way you've disrupted your professional life? I mean, after all, you're, you're lecturing in Barcelona now, uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, well, that, the, why lecturing, not why Barcelona? That's more obvious. Yeah. I like to think that I am now the type of person that disrupts myself. I will be the first to admit that is not my nature. Thank mm -hmm. goodness the universe has chosen a path for me that created that nurture side because my natural state is I am a perfectionist to a fault. That is not a humble brag. That is something about my character from birth that would have held me back from my greatest happiness had I not been forced outside of that comfort zone. So no, by nature, absolutely not. I love to do things perfectly. I love not to show any flaws or, or anything. Thankfully, my career did not tolerate that in any way. <laughs> so I have been forced to adopt and be nurtured by people who are naturally disruptive. And I'm so glad that was modeled for me because that's what's brought me the most joy. Um, I now like to disrupt my personal life as much as I can. I like to learn new things. So when I left, was leaving Google, I was really looking for the way that I could disrupt myself the most. So I moved <laughs> to the other side of the world into a culture that is not familiar to me, a language that was not familiar to me. I didn't speak a word of Spanish when I moved to Spain. Um, but I'm looking for something that will really challenge me and get me in environments where I can repackage my skills for deeper impact. 
So for example, if I had left Google, but stayed in Silicon Valley or even stayed within the United States, my impact, I think for sure would have been smaller, but bringing those skills to Europe where I'm kind of a little bit coming to them from the future because the States is about five years ahead of some of these disruptive patterns of technologies. I can then have a much deeper impact here than was possible if I stayed in my comfort zone and really help the entrepreneurs who need it the most. And I did not know that I was about to do that at a time when it was needed the most in pandemic pivots, but I just feel so grateful that I could then really reinvest that in a place that needed it most where people were desperate for the answers and to be a small part of that pivot prof process has been so rewarding to me. And I've learned a lot in the process as well. Like not only have I given this, um, knowledge and experience that I've seen from Amazon and Google, but now I've learned a lot by how do I repackage that for entrepreneurs in Europe where risk tolerances are different, investment levels are different, uh, proof of concept is required so much earlier. You have to think globally so much earlier in your growth stages than, than a U.S. entrepreneurs need to. And so I've learned so much by being of assistance here and that reciprocity has been really enriching. So yeah, I like to think, I, I seek out adventures, even outside of a career, like I am now a advanced level scuba diver, even though that absolutely terrified me. I've been skydiving. I, I speak multiple languages. I've, I just look for anything outside my comfort zone that will teach me something new about myself. For example, I signed up for my first half marathon before I'd even run a 5k. That's stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but so I did sometimes, it. sometimes the best advice is not to do what someone else has done, uh, yeah. but to, to realize what the what the uh, the spark was to that idea, which which is you know what you what you've surmised in, in all those uh, aspects is essentially testing, stroke risking yourself, or, or indeed pushing yourself. Um, we had a, a question from uh, Emma Maisie: Is there uh, anything that UK working culture stroke attitude should adopt or learn from US businesses, or equally steer well clear of? Well, so the, some of the challenges I think that come up in the UK that are different from the States is one, um, investments tend to be smaller. So if you're looking to scale really fast, uh, resources tend to be on the smaller scale. That is changing. I'm really, really happy to see that changing. But getting the investment you need for really rapid growth can be more challenging in Europe in general than in the States. Second is about um, higher education. So I really see the, the next stage of disruptive technologies coming at the PhD level. And so I really um, encourage people to get into deep tech because that's the future of, of disruption com coming. And then I think really something a little bit more applicable to maybe most smaller business owners is hiring more creatively for grit, disruption, fearlessness than for core competencies. Don't hire people that you think will be able to perform 10 out of 10 every single day. If that's your standard of success and theirs, they will never do anything disruptive or interesting. What you wanna do is hire for people who are constantly gonna be like, wow, this goal is so big, it terrifies me. I think maybe I can get 60% of that for you. But that's how you aim for the stars and hit the moon. So I think really that that attitude of like not looking for perfection, but, but looking for people who are disruptive um, is probably where I would start. Yeah, it's being being essentially challenged by others as well, because that, uh, that sort of uh, friction is what creates value. By the way, um, a disclosure point, I should say that Emma is our, our finance manager, who had uh, the great joy of joining us in in lockdown. That was uh, <laughs> that's hard, but there's, you know, there's dozens or thousands of people who've had uh, similar experiences, all finding a way of navigating uh, both ways around from companies and individuals. And um, back to this point about being a consultant, and you mentioned uh, Armadillo, uh, great uh, CRM specialists. Yeah. I, I can imagine what you give in terms of insight. You've given us so much today. But what do you personally get from this type of work? Well, I learn a lot. So while I've been mentored and apprenticed for some of the most brilliant business minds in, in the world, what I, what I am getting now from my consulting clients are in completely different industries. In fact, by rule, I don't take two clients in the same industry because I don't want any accidental you know, conflicts of interest. And because I made that decision, that means I'm in rooms where I am not the expert in your field. I have um, ed tech, agricultural tech, uh, health tech, 
CRM agencies, artificial intelligence, uh, crypto, all kinds of industries that I am not the expert in the room. And so I'm learning a lot at the table about those industries. But what I'm what I bring to the table is that outside perspective that actually can be so advantageous. So that's a role I played for most of my career at Google was I was sitting at the table with the smartest people in the world. Often I was the only one at the table without a Nobel prize, like that level of people. So getting comfortable being the dumbest person in the room and seeing my value as the non-expert. And what I discovered across my career at Google, and now I think I offer to the companies that I'm on boards of directors for, that I'm consulting for, is just asking those clarifying questions that allows the experts in the room to see something from a different perspective, see an opportunity, or maybe combine things in an unexpected way. And um, I really saw that modeled in tech really well. Some of you, often your most innovative ideas come from the lower levels in your company because they're unburdened by the way that things should be done or always have been done because they just don't know that they're offering a disruptive crazy solution to a problem. And I think I like to think that while I bring in these models of success and these patterns for how you build a team or how you scale or, or whatever it might be, I also add that element of a non-expert of what they're trying to apply it to. And that combination has been really magical because I learn a lot, they learn a lot. And, um, but it took me a while. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in my first year of like not choosing the right clients or not really understanding my value add. And now that I un understand that, I'm able to create um, some impact really fast. We've, um, we've had a, a couple of questions come in, so we're, we're going to go a little bit beyond the hour if uh, I'm sure people could be fascinated by, by this. I think that, a point about being a, a non-expert, um, as you say, you're learning, but it's also the act of asking those questions to the outside actually does make people think more deeply about why they do what they do and how they do it and why they might do something else, precisely because it's the yeah. innocence of, of lack of experience can be, can be a powerful driver. Um, I want to come to a, a, a personal question to, to well, you'll, you'll hear from the question in a sec about a, a particular life stage for someone, which is applicable to hundreds of people, thousands of people. Um, what single piece of advice would you give to a, to a single woman, uh, to single women rather, in their late 40s, early 50s, returning to their career after a break to raise children? I'm especially interested mm. in the advice you have for them with regards to building confidence and abating the imposter syndrome. Oh, I love that question. I can't speak to that from experience. I haven't been able to have kids, so I haven't had that kind of returning from maternity leave but I have four sisters. And so I've seen this many times by them. And uh, one of my sisters work, she worked with me at Google. She now works for a blue chip Silicon Valley company. She has a very demanding job. She had two sets of twins. She has four kids under the age of four right now. Like wow. anytime I think I'm having a hard day, I think about her and I'm like, never mind, cannot complain. <laughs> it's fine, I'm fine. Um, so I've really seen her be very challenged by this. Uh, she's exceptionally smart and bright and ambitious, but she, there's definitely been some hardships along the way. Mm -hmm. um, patterns I've seen that I think apply in that situation or those who are just looking to level up in their careers or be seen as a leader. You know, Maybe you're at the mid-level of your career and really want to get that big client account or get that promotion. I think my advice is the same. And that is make sure that you are on the forefront of understanding. So be reading, you know, all the media influencers or reading the journals of, of where your area of expertise is going next. And that's something you can do without permission from anybody. This is what you do in your own time. The people you follow on social media, get rid of all those like people who, when you look at their photos, they, it makes you feel bad about yourself. Get rid of that and look at instead, spend your social media time following the thought leaders that you want to become like understanding where things are being disrupted look at conferences that are talking about the topics that interest you most and do what I call uh, create your dream resume. Your dream resume actually has nothing to do with titles or even the company's names that you wanna work for. For me, it's really about knowing where your impact is that you want. What type of a leader do you wanna have? At the, what legacy are you creating? In fact, I freaked out a lot of my consulting clients <laughs> recently by asking them about their legacy. And they're like, I'm young, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just at the beginning of my dream. And I think the pandemic has really taught us that none of us know where the end of our journey is gonna be. It could be tomorrow. So what we really want to do is live in that zone of a living legacy of really 
embracing that right now, knowing what you want for yourself, because then that's how you get to be seen as a thought leader, because you are well-educated uh, in your space. You're following all the influencers. You know what they're talking about and what's really resonating in your industry right now. And I think that's also how you gain that confidence of what you know, raising your voice when you're back at that table or, or sitting down at it for the very first time. Um, but I want to, so, so having that to draw from, like you've done your homework, you've qualified yourself to be at the table. Now, once you have that background, you've done the hard work. I want to assure you that everyone at that table has moments of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite moments I had with Eric Schmidt was um, he was speaking at a Vivitech conference in Paris. I think it was in 2017. So this was fairly recently. He was very much like a well-established thought leader, highly respected. He was about to give a, a speech about artificial intelligence. It was a new speech and we were presenting it in a really new way. He was the speaker immediately before President Macron who had just been elected president of France. So this is a very big stage and a very big speech. He does this every day. Like I thought nothing of it. So as he was about to go on stage, he seemed a little nervous, which was extremely unusual. So, so much so that I was like, you, you, you good? And you're like, I'm fine, I'm fine. So when he came off stage, I had taken some notes because it was a new speech and I knew he'd want some feedback about like what worked, what didn't, how we want to perfect it. But when he came off stage, he looked at me so sincerely and he said, was that okay? And I just put my notebook of feedback down and I was like, of course it was okay. You're Eric Schmidt. And he said, you know, sometimes I still have to remind myself that I'm not little Eric from Virginia anymore. And I love that story. I love that he said that out loud to me because there's been so many times since then that I had to say to myself, you are not little Anne from Seattle anymore. You belong on this board of directors. You belong consulting these people because I absolutely have moments of being like, why didn't anyone think this was a good idea to ask me to do this? I don't know what I'm doing. But so I just want to share that as an example of everyone has that moment. That is part of what being an ambitious, successful person feels like. That's a sign of success that you're not being complacent in your comfort zone. And remind yourself you're not little Anne from Seattle anymore. That's okay. I think that, uh, that sense of being uh, at least a little scared at various points, uh, scared of being found out, scared of doing something wrong, scared of calling it incorrectly, it, it is absolutely not just no bad thing, it, it's essential. Because otherwise, to your point, you, you can readily get complacent or trade off past glories or, or whatever. Um, that's a, a, a strong point. And, and I think for, for the person who asked that question about um, uh, returning after childcare, by the way, of course, there's a bigger issue about why it is nearly always women rather than men who have that group. Yes. We're, we're perhaps not going to get into that today. But that point about taking the time as far as you can to learn, to be inspired, to follow social media. One of the joys of the internet is that virtually every single thinking ever is available to everyone now. Uh, and so there is that opportunity to learn always. But please, uh, again, to that person, as Anna said about imposter syndrome, everyone. I think it's as strong as everyone has it, bloody well ought to have it uh, at various times. So you, you are absolutely not alone. Uh, and it doesn't mean you have to bullshit your way through, but, um, but just recognize that we all have profound moments of uh, insecurity and doubt, uh, everyone always. Um, so I'm gonna to come to a question from Sam Goss of uh, Barefoot Architects. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, what memorable failure have you had that has helped you learn or grow the most? In some respects, it's a slightly broader point, in some respects, companies and people learn more from failures than from successes. What's been a, a, an indicative failure for you? <laughs> I, how much time do we have? I have so <laughs> many examples of failure. And um, I'm really glad to have worked in environments where that was really the goal, was to find the limits of, of where we could take an idea and get to there and then reverse engineer what parts are working. Um, so that was encouraged. It was a very, I was always in environments of psychological safety where I could try stuff and break it and then shine a big spotlight on it and be like, look what I did. Look what didn't work. And the, most importantly, when we talk about failure, it's really about the reason that's celebrated in Silicon Valley or in any area or career of ambition is because of the learnings that come as a result. That's how you actually accelerate how fast you learn. If you stay within your comfort zone, those those growths are micro and in incremental. You don't want incremental, you want disruptive growth. Um, a story that comes to mind, which is probably longer 
to do justice to than we have time for. So I, I'll use this as a teaser to read all the details that are de outlined in the book, but I will give you a teaser. My biggest failure was uh, two months after I was hired at Amazon, I almost killed Jeff Bezos. I um, hired- That's pretty hired, careless. Yeah, yeah, a bit careless, but worthy of dismissal, I would say. <laughs> um, so the short version of this story, which is really interesting is he was um, looking at properties to buy in Texas. I did not know at the time it was um, in order to buy his space tourism company, Blue Origin, that he just shot himself into space a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago from. I was um, there helping him build literally the foundation, buying the property on which he was building that company. It was just a dream in his head at the time. But to get to these properties, I needed to hire my very first helicopter. And that, that helicopter that I hired crashed with him inside. And I nearly killed Jeff Bezos and not only him, but the entire company of Amazon. Because at the time, every bit of value of that company was just faith in Jeff and his vision for the future. And so... Uh, it, it, it's a great story. I hope you all will, will read it in the book. But I share that as an example of failure, not because of the helicopter crash, which is kind of spectacular and um, insane experience, but it taught me something really important about myself. I, I assembled my first emergency board of directors meetings. I was prepared for press statements if he was dead, alive, injured, anything. And what I learned at the end of that experience, once I finally got a call from Jeff, finally learned that he was alive and okay, he said to me, Anne, I hear you're really good under pressure. And having that moment when he could have fired me or been very upset about how this all had gone, he instead saw someone who was capable of keeping calm, asking the right questions, assembling the right team, and dealing with pressure far exceeding her experience or expertise. And from then on, he gave me assignments that were far outside my job description. And more importantly than that, more importantly than how Jeff saw me was it changed the way I saw myself. I now changed the way I thought of me of not only being this 20 year old who had no business having this job, but I then could respond to challenges by saying like, well, at least it's not a helicopter crash. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can figure this out too. So um, that is kind of a spectacular spectacular you know, story. I've, I have much more boring examples of failure and learning really fast, but that's a favorite. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I'm sure that's something we can all learn from about not killing Jeff Bezos. Bit of a top tip there. Tends, tends not to help careers or indeed. <laughs> no. um, maybe, maybe there's that, that phrase about not, not putting all execs in one basket or something. It's uh, you know, yeah. split them up. Split them up. <laughs> We've had um, a comment. I'm, I'm not going to name the person, although she has named herself uh, in this. She said, um, thank you for, for asking my question and doing so anonymously. So I'm keeping her anonymous this time. Uh, I'm grateful. Wonderfully helpful and empowering answer. I will address meetings today with all of that in mind. How about that? Uh, what an inspiring yeah. speaker Anne is. Thank you for hosting us. So, so there you are. So uh, direct, um, direct response in action. She heard you this morning. She's going to implement some of it uh, this afternoon. Uh, great stuff. That Oops. means everything to me. Thank you. Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's really lovely. Well, Good luck to her, and as I'm not, not, not naming her, I'm sure you've got uh, you know, some fantastic opportunities in front of you. Um, I just want to come back to you personally about uh, all the different career opportunities which you, you've had. Which one were you closest to accept but didn't, and why not? Ooh, so interesting. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, yeah. So I actually um, was recruited to support Tim Cook just after he became CEO at Apple. Oh. He was looking to redesign his team because the team he inherited from his successor, Steve Jobs, and Tim is exceptional, but he is not Steve Jobs. Uh, his personality, his, his timings, everything about him is very, very different. So he wanted to kind of really be, be thoughtful about the team he was assembling around him. So they, um, the recruiters came to me to see if I was interested because of the work I'd done with Jeff and with Eric to see if I was interested in creating a new model for Tim Cook. I nearly accepted that. But the reason I didn't, I was really flattered by it. I think I would have learned a lot. I really respect Apple. The reason I didn't was it didn't feel like a big enough disruptive change. It felt a little bit like I would be rinse and repeating my skills and my experience in a new environment. And I wanted something that would challenge me in a way that would be more different from my current experience. I didn't want to let go of something. And I, I had such a good thing with Eric. We were really like completely in sync. I was at the mind reading stage with him and that was really fun. And so for me to leave 
it needed to be something that would be disruptive and um, it just felt too similar. But I still think about that often, like what it would have been like if I had gone to Apple. Is that, um, is, is that, is that one of your few regrets? You're not necessarily thinking it was wrong not to done, but you do no. reflect on whether or not it might've been right. Yeah, no, I, I think I absolutely would have learned some things. I'm, you know, I think we're always curious about the sliding door moments of, of the path not taken, but I don't know. I don't look back on it as uh, as a mistake. I do think that it was right to hang in there for a couple more years and see a way for me to do something a little crazier, which was leave and uh, start my own consulting firm. Well, the risk of being uh, very shallowly simplistic is uh, it's part of me that thinks, well, hang on a second, you could have had Amazon, Google, Apple. It's like like top trumps or something. It's a uh, fantasy career stuff. But um, yep. you know, for someone who's, uh, on the one hand, uh, quote, nearly killed Jeff Bezos, I think, <laughs> did at all, I think that was the helicopter, and two, turned down Tim Cook. That's, uh, that's kind of a remarkable uh, anecdote, and thank you. Um, perhaps one last question, unless we get anything uh, further in. Uh, you, you obviously uh, have given today uh, a lot of uh, smart thinking and smart advice. Um, but what's the best piece of career advice that you've been given personally? Oh, that's a fun question. So I'm going to I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give you three. I'm going to okay. give you lessons learned from each of the CEOs that I've worked for um, from Jeff Bezos. Uh, when I was leaving, we interviewed what felt like a million people to replace me. When I was about to go, grad school was starting and I can't change my start date. And we still hadn't found someone to fill my seat. And I was literally the chair closest to his in the company. Like literally within three feet of his own desk was mine. And I was getting really nervous because I didn't have a replacement. I didn't have anyone to train. I was leaving him short staffed. It was just horrifying to me. And I was trying to get him to reconsider some of the top candidates. And he was like, absolutely not. He was not tempted. And he said, I am only going to hire people I have to hold back not push forward. So from Jeff, I really learned the value of creating the best possible team and appreciating that the people in your immediate environment are going to affect the leader that you become. From Marissa, I, I learned to do things before I was ready. I learned from her that being ready to take on a challenge did not mean be ready to be perfect at it, which was what my perfectionist brain wanted me to feel. I wanted to be a 10 out of 10 for whatever I was volunteering for. She taught me to do things before I was ready and that you just learn the most that way. And she was so supportive as a manager of creating the safety for you to do that and break things and learn really fast and pivot and do it better next time. And then from Eric, it goes back to that lesson of being insatiably curious and saying yes to things that terrify me and force me to grow in a new way. And those three things combined, I think is the best career advice I've given. And what has made me take some seemingly crazy like risks on myself. I think my parents are still just like, have no idea what I've done <laughs> with my career. But um, those three things have informed the decisions that I've made ever since. Uh, wow, wow, wow. Well, and thank you ever so much uh, for today's, uh, you know, remarkable uh, business search we've had. Uh, thank you for your, your insights and your inspiration. Uh, I, I've personally taken a lot from it. I hope people will as well. And uh, when this is on YouTube, please share it because there's such great insights for other people uh, to, to experience and benefit from. Uh, thank, thank you very much today also for your time and your questions uh, at our biggest business surgery, as, uh, as mentioned. Uh, and thank, thank you very much. I'm going to you know, give you a, 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 a proper shout out. I think it's, it's been absolutely superb and uh, really valuable. Um, to everyone also, uh, thank you for your support for, for Bath Life and for Bristol Life. And then for our events as they come bounding back. Good luck to you all in the coming months. This has been a Media Clash production. And this has been a very special joint Bath Life and Bristol Life business surgery. Thank you. Bath together, Bristol together. Always. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.